So let's talk about some of the things that you see in CLL. If everybody got a sense now of the, of the lay of the land in the, in the genes, in the chromosomes, in the nucleus, in the cell. Let's talk about some of these. And the first one um, that, that, that I actually want to read from the opposite, not left to right, but right to left in this, is we first found out there was a problem in chromosome 17. How did we do that? The karyotype told us that there was something missing or something altered. So then you take some P, um, cells that have got this abnormal chromosome and you say, you look at it and you say, okay, in this particular, in this particular um, chromosome, which I can't open, so we'll just use it there, I have this area and I know the chemical structure of this. So now I'm gonna take from the start codon to the stop codon here, and I'm gonna see what it makes, and I'm gonna see what it does. And, and I can, oh, yours is different. Okay, here. And, and so I'll have a sense of what might be going on, and if I can, if I can identify this structure, then I can make what's called a probe. It's the mirror image of this structure. And I can then take some of your cells, mix them with this mirror imaged probe, and encourage this mirror image probe to mate with the chromosome piece that it, that it fits most comfortably with. If I attach a fluorescent dye to that probe, then I can take your cells, spread them out on a slide, shove them under a fluorescent microscope, and I can see areas of fluorescence. Well, where is that fluorescence? The fluorescence is bonded to vital air. I don't think they thought I was gonna have this much of an ad for them. They're bonded to vital air, which means you have at least one copy. Oh, look, maybe you have two copies and I get two spots of fluorescence. Or maybe I have three copies and I get three spots of fluorescence. When people talk about fluorescent in situ hybridization, fish, the technique that they're looking at, well, it's not quite vital air, but it's close enough. I'm, I, I'm trying to see, I have a probe, I know what the probe does or doesn't do, and I wanna see how many of the pieces of your chromosome can be bonded to this particular probe. And I can count the number of them that you have. Do you have maybe three copies? Do you have no copies? Do you have some copies but not enough copies? Do you have a copy that doesn't bind as well as it should? I, I can figure this out. And so far, we know that there are four major areas of vital air that seem to be tied in to CLL. Some of them are good things to have, some of them are bad things to have, but we know they're tied in somehow with the progression of, of CLL. Um, and, and I have to kind of step back here. Um, human investigation of DNA was not the first time we tried to understand what a genome was. So consequently, some of the names and some of the titles come from pri previous work in other facilities on other species. So for example, Notch 1 was actually first found in a fruit fly. And um, to talk about the evolution of life, I guess, Notch 1 in a fruit fly this is going to be a toughie. Notches the fruit fly's wings. It doesn't do that to you. You haven't had those for a while. Um, but what it does in your system is provide um, an unwelcome resilience that you don't necessarily want. So you have that. You'll notice the chromosome. I keep wanting to point. Notice the chromosomes here. They should look somewhat familiar. 
There are people walking around here who, you know, shook my hand and said, hi, I'm 17P deleted. I think really your name was Fred, but um, yes, see the chromosomes, 17, 11, 9. These are common chromosomes that people talk about. Why don't we talk about all of them? Because some of the damage is so small that in the karyotype we can't really see it. So it's easier to just talk about the mutation itself than to tell you, oh, well, you know, you have this, this minuscule, non-visible mutation on a chromosome. So we just talk about the, the actual mutation itself. As of about six months ago, there were at least five more of these mutations that we know people with CLL have got. We're not entirely sure what they do. Um, and first we have to find out what they have to do normally, and then we have to figure out what they do in people with CLL. So um, will you hear more about these? Yes. Is there a problem with their nomenclature? Because it actually makes no sense. Um, the biggest problem is that because other people were working on other genera, um, they were working on other diseases, there are some initials that mean two different things. So if I'm in a room with a bunch of people who've got CML and I talk about BCR, they think I mean breakpoint cluster region. Uh, but you don't, you've never heard that before. You think of it as B cell receptor. So when I, this is a private plea, um, when I say on some of the lists, could you spell that out for me? Um, it's mostly because you're using an abbreviation that might have been used in two or three other diseases, meaning two or three other things. So abbreviations are cool. They make you sound very jargony when, when you talk about somebody having a, um, a BIRCH3 mutation, but, but it would be helpful if it were more completely discussed.